Malta is beautiful, there's no doubt. As we move on to this episode, don't forget to catch up on parts 1 and 2 if you haven't already, and they're linked in the description below. Meanwhile, let's get cracking on part 3 of this beautiful Malta adventure. Step 1, wake up early, gonna rise with the sun. Step 2, get some good, some food in you. Step 3, think grow hard about what you wanna be. Step 4, fuck everybody just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. And good morning everyone and welcome back to my video. It is a brand new day here in Malta and I'm coming to you from Gozo Island and this behind me is Marsophon. I think I'm getting that right. Yeah, Marsophon. So today is a brand new episode. I've been here for the last um, couple of days already. So come along with me and um, see what my Maltese adventure can bring me today. Let's do this. The Republic of Malta. With a population of just over 500,000 people, it's the world's 10th smallest country by size and the fifth most densely populated. With a rich historic beauty and a coastline blessed by coves and cliffs, let's see what this spectacular destination has in store for the curious. With much reluctance, we were now leaving Masa El Fon and making a beeline for Imga Harbour where we will plonk the car into a ferry to take us across the channel back to the main island of Malta. If you're new to my channel, my name's Ryan. Born and bred in Singapore, I now call Australia home, and I create heaps of travel and food-related content. In this travel series, we travel through seven countries in two and a half weeks. We started in Singapore, then found ourselves in France, from that long journey, our final destination is here in Malta, where we'll spend most of our time. We move on to Italy, Switzerland, UK, and finally Vietnam before flying home to Australia. So this series will be filled with heaps of flight reviews, train journeys, destination vlogs to last a few months. If you don't wish to miss any episodes, make sure you stay tuned for future videos and they will be linked in the description below as and when they're published. Even better, hit subscribe and the bell icon so you'll be notified whenever the next episode goes to air. Giving me a like will encourage me to keep content flowing, so here's a thanks because your support is very much appreciated. If you'd like to know details of this ferry crossing, it was all covered in the previous episode so please feel free to have a look at that. Meanwhile, we're back on the island of Malta, and Google Map takes us along a scenic ride towards the first destination for this episode today. Welcome to the town of Mostar. With a population of just over 23,000 residents, it is very densely populated, with its existence radiating outwards from this centerpiece of a beautiful architectural history. The first recorded evidence of inhabitation in Mostar dates back to prehistoric times, which makes Mostar's history more than 3 million years old. Today, Mostar has become one of the busiest commercial centres outside of Valletta, and by all accounts, one of the largest urban centres on the island. So after arriving in Malta from Gozo off the ferry, so the first stop that we're going to go to is the Mosta Dome. So we are in the town of Mosta and right in the center, the central piazza, there's this grand looking dome. That's where we're going. Yeah, let's do that. And this is what I'm referring to. It's officially known as Sanctorio Basilica da Santa Maria, Sanctuary Basilica of the Assumption of Our Lady, or it's more commonly known as the Rotunda of Mostar. If that's still too much of a mouthful for you, asking for the Mostar Dome will point you here as well. How grand does this thing look? I 
mean, I've been here a couple of days now. I've been to a lot of piazzas and I've been to a lot of cathedrals that's plonked right in the middle of piazzas. But this takes the cake, seriously. I mean, wow. The best way to appreciate the grandeur of this basilica is to be here in person. Because photos and video footages cannot capture just how beautiful this whole structure looks. Construction of this Roman Catholic church began in 1833 and took some 30 years to complete. The neoclassical design is based on the Pantheon in Rome, which explains similar architectural underpinnings which forms the facade. There is an entry fee of 5 euros which gives you access not just into the main hall of this basilica, but also to the upper balconies of the dome and the World War II underground shelter which we will all touch on as this video progresses. Let's take a moment to soak it all in. The audible gasp of everyone who walked through this entrance was a testament to this absolutely beautiful and stunningly constructed piece of architectural marvel. We're standing within one of the largest unsupported dome structures in the world. This is also Malta's largest and most famous church. So welcome to the Church of All Churches right here in this island republic. It is noteworthy that Giorgio Grogne di Vassi, the architect of this dome, had never received any formal architectural training. And the proposal to build this church in the neoclassical design based on the Pantheon in Rome was initially rejected. Nevertheless, this basilica today welcomes up to a million visitors each year because of its beauty. I'm not a religious person, but this seriously took my breath away. We cannot talk about Malta without talking about World War II. Stay with me because this will segue into the next story about this church. During the war, Europe was divided into the forces of Allied and Axis, the latter consisting of Nazi Germany and Italy who was under the fascist rule of Benito Mussolini. Since Malta was some 80 kilometers from the closest shoreline of Italy, this put Malta, which was under British rule, in a very vulnerable position because this island held access to other British colonies in Northern Africa. As a result, Malta holds the record for the country who suffered the most bombardment during the war, sustaining from some 154 days of non-stop bombardment, utilizing up to 6,700 tons of bombs, destroying much of the country's infrastructure. During this period, Mosta, because of its proximity to the military airfield nearby in Takali, was very prone to aerial bombardment. So on the 9th of April 1942, the German Air Force launched an attack on Mosta and dropped three 50 kg high explosive bombs, all aimed at the Mosta Dome. Three of these bombs surprisingly did not detonate, with two of them deflecting off the dome and the third one managing to pierce through and entering the main hall of the church. There were 300 people gathered as the bombs came down because they were there for an evening mass. These unexploded bombs were eventually diffused and carried away to be disposed into the sea. This event has been interpreted as a miracle by Mosler's residents, and it is still talked about today as you gather for coffee around the various cafes in the piazza. There is a replica of this bomb on display within the museum to give you an idea of how much potential damage and loss of lives this bad boy could have caused. Just outside the church is the World War II shelter, which was constructed to protect the residents from the impending air raids. The stairs leading down are the original ones, and that means steep, narrow, and uneven. So extra care has to be taken. This shelter was started in 1940 and was dug out by 15 people. The ground around Mosta is mostly rock, and this tunnel is no exception. Therefore, a unique rock cutting method which Mosta is famous for was employed to form this shelter. It took these workers five months to complete the tunnel, working in different shifts over 24 hours a day. 
The final shelter we see today is 75 meters long and 20 feet below the ground. In our peaceful times, we are allowed a glimpse into the desperate situations these residents of Mostar were placed during that time. Because these bombardments were very prolonged, people lived here for a while as their town of birth was getting blown to bits. So there are exhibits of crockery, living spaces, tools, and other personal items which were left down here after the war. Very sombering. As we settled down for lunch, I started thinking about Maltese cuisine. Putting this simple but delicious sandwich aside, my mind started drifting towards the quintessential pastizzi. You know, whenever I visit a new country, I'm all about trying traditional foods because this is what makes up um, the culture. And one of the more prominent um, Maltese savoury items is a pastizzi. It's really a puff pastry with um, all kinds of uh, filling in there. Normally there's ricotta cheese, there's peas. And everywhere you go around Malta, you're going to find a pastizzeria, which is the one behind me. So they sell all sorts of pastizzi. So I'm not ready to eat yet. Uh, so at, at some point, I'm going to try to get my hands on some pastizzi and it's going to happen today. So it'll happen at some point. Oh, who the hell am I kidding? Me not ready to eat? Seriously? Anyway, there are traditionally two types of pastizis, which is either ricotta cheese or curried peas. In recent times, this variety has been expanded to include the popular chicken version, which I've got today, together with a ricotta cheese. Let's shut off all other soundtracks now and listen to the unmistakable crisp of the ultra buttery and sinful layered pastry, which is similar to phyllo pastry. Mmm, every time I hear that crunch anywhere around the world, it's going to remind me of Malta and their delicious pastizis. This one here, which is folded in the middle like a diamond, with an opened top, is to signify ricotta cheese. Anyone with a filthy mind would need to stop giggling like we're still in high school. Because the Maltese word for, you know, that thing you're thinking about is pastiz. If the pastizzi is folded in any other way, like this one to the side, it is to signify a flavour other than ricotta. This is the one filled with savoury chicken, and it is definitely my favourite. Why aren't there more pastizzerias in Australia is still a mystery to me. If anyone is watching this and you'd like the next business idea, why not open one in Adelaide? I'd definitely be the first in line for these crispy, buttery delights. With our tummies satisfied with pastizis, we're now headed towards the fishing port of Oedi Zurich. This is an extremely popular location from where tourists set off to explore the Blue Grotto on boats. If you're not into caves, there are also heaps of cafes and restaurants for you to relax in and just take in the beautiful coastline. These dramatic cliffs and caves have also been the backdrop of several movies like Hellboats and Troy. The fare to get on board this boat for a 30 minute ride costs 10 euros per person. Don't worry if you miss one, because these boats leave the jetty every 15 to 20 minutes so there will always be one waiting. The location of these caves lead to the seawater reflecting shades of blue on the cave walls and ceiling, leading to its name of Blue Grotto. Underwater, different shades of red, green, orange and yellow makes a really beautiful sight. However, these colour shows only happen when the sky is a clear blue with the sun shining. If you're here in winter, the seasonal overcast English weather gives it a very depressing grey on grey and beige on beige. However, I still think it is a very relaxing way to spend 30 minutes of your life just appreciating these natural formations. Plus the reasonable fare of 10 euros do give these boat operators an opportunity to earn a living. I guess that's a win-win situation for all. 
Ultimately, this is all very impressive. In summer, this is also an extremely popular sport for snorkeling and shipwreck exploration. After the last couple of days spent out in the country, we're now heading into civilization. And into the city district we go, next to the capital Valletta. We're going to be spending the next two nights in Floriana. So we check into the Grand Excelsior Hotel by the waterfront. While this hotel has seen better days and is a little old school, the location is unbeatable because it's tucked away from the busy traffic around the outer walls of Valletta. And you're not too far away to walk from where the action is. We haven't really rested properly from our journey since we left Adelaide some 5 days ago. So you can imagine the exhaustion creeping up on us by this time. Still, as we enter the room, we can appreciate this amazing view of Tashabesh across the marina. So we have just settled down at the hotel and um, on our way in, we saw a Christmas market. That's the one behind me. So we're just going to take a walk in there uh, before we head to dinner. Um, hopefully we'll eat around here. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a pretty long and tiring day. So we'll see what happens after the Christmas market. Let's go take a walk. Let's go. 89% of Maltese are Christians. So you can bet your bottom dollar the entire 12 days of Christmas is well observed. We're walking through Fairyland Malta, an annual Christmas market set up just outside the walls of Valletta, Malta's capital city. This one you see here was operational between 8th of December 2023 to 7th January 2024. While I'm not personally into Christmas, I do enjoy soaking in the atmosphere of a pop-up market like this one here. It was filled with food stands, snack bars, artisan stalls and souvenir carts, each and every one warmly beckoning you in to part with your hard-earned euros. There was also a stage where you were encouraged to get up and sing karaoke style. And let's not forget the stunning Triton fountain in the middle of this beautiful piazza. The giant ferris wheel rounded off the amazing atmosphere with lots of smiles, selfies and sugar high. This is the 28th of December. And we've been on the road for the last four days with little sleep on three flights, three hotel stays, and lots of coffee to stay awake. At some point, your body will begin to shut down, and this was what happened tonight. We had grand plans to walk to Valletta after the Christmas market, but our eyes could not even stay open. So we ended up back at the hotel for dinner. By this stage, even my taste buds had shut down because the roast chicken was so bland, I reached for the salt. And I even found the salt very bland. So as I tuck into dinner, let me take this opportunity to wish you a warm and sincere grazie usaha. And let's join live Ryan out in the balcony after dinner to conclude this video. And just like that, we've come to the end of another day here in Malta. So I hope you join me next week to see what else can I do in this um, exciting country. Uh, this is my first visit. I'm really, really so happy to be here. So let me know in the comments, what do you think um, of Malta so far? Would you want to come here and visit after watching this video or have you been here before? So let me know in the comments and I'm pretty eager to hear from you. So in the meantime, I've checked details of my Instagram on your screen right now. So hit me up there and chuck me a follow so you can actually see where am I traveling to in real time. And it will also give you an idea of the type of videos that will be coming up on my YouTube channel. So in the meantime, take care all of you and I hope I'll see you next week on the next episode of this beautiful Malta adventure. I'll see you next week. Bye.